All right, time for Newton's second law. Um, kind of follows up on the first law, the law of inertia, the idea that objects in motion stay in motion, the objects at rest stay at rest unless an outside force acts upon it. Newton's second law takes force, mass, and acceleration and gives us a mathematical formula. And I know we're all excited about that because that involves math problems. So in our overview, we're just kind of looking at the question, what is Newton's second law of motion? And what is the relationship between a force, a mass, and an acceleration that we kind of went over in the first law of motion? Really, the only new word involved here is a Newton. Um, you possibly have seen it at some point before. In this case, we're not necessarily talking about the person, but we're talking about a unit of measurement. Newton's second law is basically boiled down into this mathematical equation, which says that a net force will accelerate an object in the direction of a force. Um, so if the force is moving to the right, then it's going to accelerate the object to the right. And again, this has to be a net force. It's not just any force. In other words, an overall unbalanced force. Again, this was kind of like inertia was because inertia said that an object will not accelerate unless an unbalanced force is acting on it. But this kind of quantifies it and puts it in math for us. So as a review, to get an acceleration, we need unbalanced forces of some type. If forces end up being balanced, then we don't get acceleration. An object can be moving, even though uh, there's no acceleration. So just because something has got a force acting on it doesn't mean a whole lot. You have to look at the whole situation. And so if an object is in motion, it may have forces that are unbalanced, but it can have forces that are balanced. If the forces are balanced, the object in motion, it's just not accelerating. The more force we apply to something, the more acceleration we're going to get out of it. Now, the other part of this is the issue of mass, because mass deals with inertia. And so if we have something that has is more massive, then pushing it equally is not going to accelerate it as much. For example, it can pair basketball and a bowling ball. If we push each of them with the same amount of force, we're going to get less acceleration from the bowling ball because it's more massive. Now, so if we wanted to get the same acceleration from the bowling ball and the basketball, I could do that, but I would have to apply more force to the bowling ball because of it's uh, having a larger mass and a greater amount of inertia. Oftentimes, when we're looking at an object, there are more than one. There's more than one force acting upon it. So in this case, with something sitting on a table, you can see the arrows. One's pointing up, one's pointing down. These are in opposite directions. They're equal lengths, and so these should cancel each other out. And the way that this is labeled, the F with the W, this is kind of labeled as the force due to the, from the weight. And then there's an N force, the FN, which is called a normal force, which we'll use a good bit later on. Uh, and this is simply the table holding the brick up. Since these are equal and opposite, the forces are balanced, we don't get any acceleration out of it. So oftentimes, again, there are forces applied to an object and we don't see it accelerating simply because that force might be balanced out in the opposite direction. So in the mathematical relationship, force equals mass times acceleration. We can rewrite the formula. So if we wanted mass by itself, we need to move the acceleration to the other side by dividing it out. So the relationship between force and acceleration would give us an idea if we needed to solve for mass. And usually this is the one that's a little bit more typical. If we wanted to determine the acceleration, again, we need to move the M to the other side. And the force divided by the mass tells us our acceleration. And what this one works out again is the bigger the force, the greater the acceleration. But since mass is on the bottom of the fraction, the greater the mass, actually the less acceleration we get. And so here's our vocabulary term. When we measure a force, that force is going to be in newtons. Um, mass is going to be in kilograms. And acceleration we've done is meters per second squared. When we multiply that together, we start getting a big unit, which is kilogram meters per second squared. And so we just simplify that and call it a newton. And a newton is a unit of force. So here comes the fun part. We'll solve some, look at some word problems. Oftentimes with word problems, we have to take into account all the forces that are acting on something. So we, again, we want to figure out what's the net force. The net force is the sum of all the forces that's going to be acting on something. And if we have something in one dimension, then we're simply adding them up in that one dimension and taking into account that there may be a negative if something's going in the opposite direction. When we have a two-dimensional motion, then we need to apply the Pythagorean theorem again uh, to get a resultant vector. And then we could use the inverse tangent function on the calculator to figure out what angle that it would be moving in as we went through. So a few examples, if we wanted to find the net force of things, again, looking at this image, what's the net force of this image? Um, and if you're in my class, you've got some notes to be able to take on this to kind of summarize things. But if I have this image, then the net force is going to be 
both of these forces added together. Um, again, it's not 50 plus 20 because they're in opposite directions. So we would take the left direction and call it a negative and then add them together. And we would get a resultant force of 30 Newtons to the right on this one. All right, similarly, this diagram shows 15 Newtons up and 45 Newtons down. So if we wanted to get the net force again, we need to add all the forces together. And to take into account, these are going in opposite directions. Generally, the down direction is considered to be negative. So I've got 15 going up and 45 going down. Put those together, and we get a uh, resultant force of negative 30 Newtons. And this is going to be 30 Newtons in the downward direction. A little more complicated is if we had an object and it was getting pulled to the right and pulled up and think about which way that it would go. Since this is in two dimensions, we would still want to put our forces together, but because they're not in the same direction, we would need to apply the Pythagorean theorem. Now, the way that this is drawn, doesn't we, our triangle actually would not be drawn the way that my pointer is showing right now, because when we add vectors, we always want to add the base of a vector to uh, the head of the other one. So we would really need to move this eight Newton vector and stick it onto the end over here so that we went six to the right and then eight up. And so our resultant vector would then be going to the upper right hand corner. If we made that triangle, our two sides of our triangle would be eight and six. And so we would use the Pythagorean theorem, square both of those numbers and take the square root. So then the resultant uh, force would be 10 Newtons. And then we would want to take the direction. And again, to get the direction, we use the inverse tangent function. Um, of our two sides. So the opposite side would be the eight length, the adjacent side would be the six. And so as we've done before, if I want, as I, if I drew this arrow, again, if I put these in the right order, I have an arrow going to the right and then an arrow going up, my resultant is going to connect those in the direction my pointer is going right now. And the angle that it's going to be made is 53 degrees and it will be 53 degrees north of west. Now, if we needed to calculate the acceleration, we would need to be given a little bit more information. So in the three pre previous problems, what would the acceleration be if we had a five kilogram object that was in the picture? Well, remember five kilograms is a mass. And then in each of those other problems, we determined the force already. So in order to get the acceleration, we would just take the force value and divide it by the mass. So in problem number one, if we found that it was a 30 Newton force and we knew that we have a five kilogram mass, we would simply do 30 divided by five and our acceleration is six, and it's still gonna be in the same direction that the force is applied. So that's another thing to keep in mind that when we get a, an acceleration measurement, that's still gonna be a vector, and the acceleration is gonna be in the same direction that the force was in. On number two, we had 30 Newtons down, and we, if we had a five kilogram mass, again, so we would take the mass, excuse me, take the force and divide it by the mass. 30 divided by five is gonna be six, so we get the same answer, but this one's gonna be in the down direction. And then finally, the last one, we determined that the force was 10 Newtons and we knew the direction was 53 degrees north of west. Again, if we had a five kilogram mass, we take force, divide it by mass, and that gives us our acceleration. So 10 divided by five gives us two. So we'd have a, an acceleration of two meters per second squared and the direction would be 53 degrees north of west. So effectively, that's Newton's second law, uh, that force, force equals mass times acceleration, and we can rearrange that as needed. It's essentially a follow-up of the first law of inertia, which is telling us that objects will continue their motion unless an unbalanced force acts upon it. So both of these laws deal with forces, and they deal with masses, and they deal with acceleration. Um, but this is the one that's going to give us a formula to kind of quantify that and be able to put it into a math, math um, language.